Well, I guess we're starting. The music stopped. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Sunday worship here at FBC Brewster. How's everyone this morning? Very good. Very good. How's everyone at home tuning in? Are you doing well, too? We hope so. And we want to thank you all for coming to uh, worship with us today. Uh, so if you're on the live stream or you're here in person, we just thank you and we welcome you. And if this is your first time, we thank you even more. Uh, and also let us know a little bit about yourself if you're just tuning in. We've got a communication card that you can kind of uh, tell us what's going on. So don't forget about that. And of course, if you um, are some of our members, we would love to hear from you. If you haven't been filling out your communication card, it's the best way to let us know how to pray for you too. So please consider that. All right, here are this week's announcements. Just a reminder, there's always a Sunday morning prayer time at 10 a.m. on Zoom. The link is in the FBC calendar. Next week, October 31st at 9 a.m. in front of the old Putnam uh, County Courthouse, there will be a gathering to pray for the upcoming election. We encourage everyone to come out for that. It will be led by clergy from the local area. Next Sunday, November 1st, we start something very exciting here at our church, which is 21 days of prayer and fasting. Um, continuing with, uh, pray it's called Praying the King's Agenda. And we're doing this um, for our country. So if, if you uh, are here, you can pick up, there's a booklet in the back. You can pick that up on your way out. They're at both doors. And um, if you're at home, you can download the booklet from brewsterchurch.com under the resources tab, top of the page, resources. I'm very excited also to announce Operation Christmas Child is back. Woo! Something we do every year if you're not familiar. Um, and there's shoe boxes that you, you fill with uh, small to toys, uh, hygiene items, school supplies, as a means of reaching out to children affected by war, poverty, uh, natural disaster and disease with, with basically these are ways to bring the good news of Jesus Christ to places where it's very dark. So we encourage you to get involved. And this year there's sort of a, um, a COVID option, if you will, uh, where you can pack your box online completely. You don't actually have to go to the store. You can, you can like, you know, create a box online. This is pretty cool. Um, so, you, you know, if you want to go that route, you can do it as well. All you need to do is to go to SamaritanPurse.com and uh, get started. You'll see everything you need to know on the website. In the back, there are shoe boxes and forms that you would fill out. Uh, so, please, just one thing to remember. No candy. No candy. Uh, it's not allowed in the boxes. And you just need to get your boxes back by November 8th. And we're going to watch a short video, but before we do that, I just want to give a shout of thanks to everyone who came out last night, last evening, for the outdoor worship. Uh, yeah, I want to thank all the people who helped to make it come together. Woo, yeah! Um, I hope you were encouraged. For those of you who didn't, uh, weren't able to participate, good news, you can still actually watch it online. We, it's recorded, it's on Facebook, and it's on YouTube. Or if there was a particular song or part that you just wanted to, to relive, uh, feel free to check it out, it's there for you. Now, the video, and then we'll start our worship with singing and praise. Hi everyone, we have some exciting news. With just a few clicks, you can pack an Operation Christmas Child shoebox gift online and share God's love with a boy or girl in need around the world. Simply select toys and other fun items you'd like to include from our collection and personalize your gift with your own letter and photo. Samaritan's Purse will then pack the gift for you and send it on its way for a donation of just $25. And now we're introducing Goal Pages. It's a great way to pack shoeboxes online and encourage your church or group to participate. In a few easy steps, you can create a custom web page and track your progress towards a shoebox goal. Just upload an image or logo, write an inspiring message, and set a goal for how many shoebox gifts you want to pack. You'll receive a unique link from your page that you can share via email or social media. Then watch your goal tracker to see how many children will be blessed with the good news of Jesus Christ. And remember to pray for the children who will receive your shoeboxes that their lives would find the hope of the gospel. 
Visit SamaritansPurse.org slash build online for more information. Nice. Well, good morning. I just wanted to share with you some um, verses, um, Ephesians 2.10. For we are God's handiwork, creating Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old is past, the new things have come. So we are created for good things. We are, God has done an amazing work in us, and we need to thank him and praise him for this. So let us together sing and worship his holy name who cares so much to create us and make us new. I've been changed, I've been filled, I've been found, I've been freed, I've been saved. In Jesus' blood, I've been loved, I've been cleansed and redeemed, released, rearranged. How can I show you that I'm grateful? You've been so generous to me. Redemption's melody. I have been blessed. Now I want to be a blessing. I have been loved. Now I want to bring love. I've been invited. I want to share the invitation. I have been changed to bring change, to bring change. In Jesus' name, we are changed, we are called, we are chosen, adopted, and named. In Jesus' blood, we are loved, we are healed, we are forgiven, and freed, and no shame. We want to show you that we're thankful, flooding your world with hope and peace. Help us to work. More than singing, giving redemption's hands and feet. We have been blessed, now we're gonna be a blessing. We have been loved, now we're gonna be loved. We've been invited, we're gonna share the invitation. We have been changed to bring change, to bring change. We have been changed to bring change, to bring change. Thank you for this new life. Thank you for the invitation. God, we want to live out loud enough to shape the nations in your name. We have been saved. We're going to shout about the Savior. change to bring change to bring change we have been changed to bring change to bring change we have been changed to bring change to bring change
Abraham, his love and his mercy. Our God is exalted on his throne, high above the heavens, forever he's worthy. And we will keep our eyes on you. We will keep our eyes on you. A mighty fortress is our God. A sacred refuge is your name. Your kingdom is unshakable.
we just thank you that, um, God, that you have done so much for us and that you are there for us. And God, that you are a generous God and that you love you and you pour out your mercies, you pour out your generosity. And Lord, we want to take this time and um, thank you. Thank you with our hearts, thank you with our voices, but also take time to thank you with the resources that you've already given us. Because we want you to take those and we want you to bless the world with them. Because of what you've done for us. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. 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 Iram, Iram, Orientem. This Latin phrase best describes what I've been feeling for several months now. Iram, Iram, Orientem. I felt it. I believe many of you have been feeling it these past few months as well. Iram, Iram, Orientem. It's been pervading all of us, being felt throughout our nation. Any idea what it is? There's an author whose works I enjoy reading. He offered an interesting insight at times. He made this interesting claim that riots and comedy are what symptoms of the times, profoundly revealing. They betray the psychological tone, deep uncertainties, and the striving for something better, plus the fear that nothing would come of it all. I believe there's some truth to this quote. A lot of what we call comedy today is often very, it's been very cynical, very slanderous, vulgar or bitter, often poking fun at politics or people in authority positions. Mockery replaces civil discourse, snipe comments on Facebook, usurps rational discussion. We prefer the cheap joke over an honest exchange of ideas. There's little need to remind you all of the riots that have been so right spread in our nation right now. Spirit of Iram Iram Orientum is everywhere we look. Perhaps even most terrifying of all, we find that Iram Iram Orientum is prevalent even in the one we put our hope in. I was reading Ezekiel chapter 20. And this one verse stuck with me for the past couple of weeks. Verse 31 proclaims that when you offer your gifts, the sacrifice of your sons in the fire, you continue to defile me with all your idols to this day. Am I to let you inquire of me? As surely as I live, declares the Sovereign Lord, I will not let you inquire of me. Malachi chapter 2 verse 2 also foretells a very ominous warning. God says, if you do not listen and if you do not set your heart to honor my name, I will send a curse upon you and I will curse your blessings. Yes, I have already cursed them because you have not set your heart to honor me. Why do I bring this up? Because a lot of us are often asking, why would God allow all this tragedy to occur this year? Is he not able to fix it? Does he have not love us? In reading these verses, it brings back to mind um, the awesome solemnity of what kind of God we serve. Um, we, have we forgotten what, he, what kind of God we serve? Do we, do we believe he owes us in some way? Do we, have we forgotten that he's, he is a holy king who daily, all of us, even myself, we, we offend daily with our transgressions and our unrighteousness. Think often about the pride, the perversion, and greed that has become so, so characteristic in this modern world. Why, why should God listen to us? And so, God's Iram Yaram Orientum is starting to pour out upon the world. And in response, the world reacts with its own impotent Iram Iram Orientum. The world cannot harm God, of course, 
So it will inevitably turn and attack God's people. Have you guessed what your own, your own orientum is? It's anger. Rising anger. It's an anger against sin and an anger against righteousness. The barely suppressed anger of those who, who live along others, who hold beliefs and opinions different from them, even beliefs which cannot be reconciled. Conflict and bickering are, of course, inevitable when such disparities are forced to be together. But there is hope. And in contrast to this, we are cautioned by the Apostle Paul to tell us that in our anger, in our anger, we are not to sin. The Gospel also teaches us that as much as it up to us, we are to live at peace with everyone. And even, uh, even God himself tells us that we have to live in submission to the, to the authorities, even when we disagree with whatever policies and practices they put in place. So while anger, rising anger, is rising between God and this fallen world, we the church are not to be caught up in the flame. We've got a, we got a special assignment. And it's because we need to represent God's love and mercy to those who are caught up in all of this, this rage and insanity. And it's because God, that is because God, in spite of his wrath, he is ever willing to forgive even the most heinous of sins if there is true repentance. Do I take any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the sovereign Lord? Rather, am I not pleased when they turn from their ways and repent? We will continue to display God's love and mercy, and we will continue to display this love between ourselves. Our, our nation is angrier than ever before, and if those that are lost cannot find solace and peace from all this rage in the church, where then can they look? Good morning. Good morning. Uh, join me with a, a word of prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you that you bless us to be a blessing. Uh, thank you that you invite us to reflect and represent you to our hurting and broken world. Lord, it is an honor, yet that invitation is overwhelming. It's, it, it should cause us to really just be desperate for you. And Lord, as we open up your word today to discover good news, Lord, give us eyes to see and ears to hear and, and minds to comprehend and hearts to respond. And we just don't want to pray that for ourselves, but we pray that for Faith Church in New Milford. Lord, may their service, which is like ours, in person and online, may, may people listening to that service treasure you above all else. May the Spirit of the living God work afresh in their hearts and their minds so that the change that is happening in their own lives, they would, they would express it to see change in our local and our global communities. And we pray that for ourselves as well right here at FBC. In Christ we pray. Amen. 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 Well, first things first, uh, I'm wearing a t-shirt, and you might be trying to read what this says. Uh, you may notice my wife is wearing one. Um, well, it relates to the message, and instead of reading this to you, uh, we're going to watch a, a short video. It was actually a commercial. All right, that came out 23 years ago by a company that, that you might have heard before. All right, it's Apple. All right, now if you have an iPhone, if you have an iPad, if you have a Mac computer, the Apple in the in the mid 90s was very competitive. But but because of this commercial that you're going to see. It just sort of picked up, it soared 
In fact, this commercial that you're going to see uh, won an Emmy in 1998. In 2000, it, it was awarded the best marketing campaign in America. Let's watch this video. Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. About the only thing you can't do is ignore them because they change things. They push the human race forward. While some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. So, Apple touched into a longing that's in the human heart. That is this, this idea of that I want to be something bigger. I want to be a part of something that is, is much grander than myself. And that's to, to see change. Change in the world. And, and Apple sort of connected the dots. So people thought, because before this commercial, Apple was just sort of the average of all of the companies. But, but because of this marketing campaign, people thought, if I buy a, a Mac computer, then, then I'll be a part of changing the world. And, and, and Apple just took off. It, it soared. Now I bring this up because as we continue with our fall teaching series, Stranger Things in the Bible, person that we're going to look at today, the, the book of the Bible that we're going to explore is considered to be crazy, right? Uh, the person specifically is called Ezekiel. And if this t-shirt was around, they, he would wear it. Maybe you maybe make the edit. At, at the end it says, uh, there are people who are crazy enough to think that they can change the world. I mean, Ezekiel will say, hey, listen, it's not, it's not people, it's God. And so if you're here and you're like, well, I believe that God can change the world. Right? If you think that, then you are like Ezekiel, the crazy one. Right? If you're crazy enough to think that God can change the world through you, then you'd be like, this t-shirt's for you. Right? Now, Ezekiel was a prophet of God in the 6th century BC. And the, his message and his methods were edgy. Okay. They were crazy, to say the least. In fact, Jewish history tells us that if someone wanted to become a rabbi, they would say, listen, that's great, but in your preparation, please do not read or study the book of Ezekiel. Because <laughs> if you do, you may just change your mind. In fact, uh, there are portions of Ezekiel that are so graphic in nature. All right? I mean, some of you might, I, I might want to read Ezekiel this week because there are certain portions that are so graphic that the Jewish leaders said, we do not want them, these, these portions of scripture to be read publicly. We, we don't want them to be read in the temple. We don't want them to be read in the synagogue. Again, this is, this is the word of the Lord. And yet you have people saying, I, I don't want them to be read publicly. Well, this is Ezekiel. Now, if you asked uh, professing Christians, what do you think of Ezekiel? You know, there might be a few that would be like, I'm not 
familiar. Is that, is, that a, is that a book in the Bible? Some maybe have started to read Ezekiel, but they didn't finish it. Uh, and maybe that's you. You started it, but you didn't finish it. And the reason why you didn't finish it, because you think it's just so bizarre. The second truth is this, is that God is on the move. God is on the move. That God's presence cannot be contained in a building like the temple in Jerusalem. Okay, so, so Ezekiel's a Jew, and all Jews are all, listen, you've got to go to Jerusalem. That's where God dwells. And so Ezekiel probably was a little shocked and surprised that he's, he's living in Babylon, far, far removed from Jerusalem, and yet God shows up. Uh, likewise, today, people think, listen, the presence of God is in a church building. And God dwells here. But God dwells everywhere. God dwells in anyone who claims to follow Jesus. God is on the move. There's a lot of negative things about this COVID pandemic. But let me mention two positives regarding the church. Right? What God is trying to, to wake up Christians, right? There's actually more than just two, but here's just two. One is this, the beauty of the gathered church and the power of the scattered church. And so uh, before COVID, certainly there are, there are some professing Christians that took for granted the gathering of people. I mean, there's, there's a beauty. Right? And I realize that those of us here that are, that are meeting at FBC, this is an ideal, this too shall pass, okay? But there's something about being together. This is what people miss. They miss, they long for community. They, they miss that. And so this whole COVID pandemic is like, listen, there, there's a beauty in the gathered church. That when we gather, we don't gather just so that we can feel better about ourselves. That we, we gather together because there's a mission. God has a mission to, to send us out, to scatter to our spheres of influence, to our workplaces, to our neighborhoods, to our, to our family, to our extended family. And when you are scattered, okay, you're, you're going to face challenges. You're going to face discouragement. You're going to have prayer requests. And yet, so you're scattered, and then that drives you back to be gathered with like-minded Christians so that you can encourage one another. You can pray for one another. You can love on one another. And then you scatter back. And so this whole COVID pandemic has helped realizing, hey, here's two things and that's always been true, but sometimes we've taken for granted. The beauty of the gathered church and the power of the scattered church. Well, back to Ezekiel. We, the last verse we read in chapter 1 says, he, he, he fell face down. He didn't quite understand exactly what was going on, but he knew, listen, God's on the move. And the glory of the Lord is bigger than what he had thought. And then he hears a voice speaking. Ezekiel grew up, always wanted to be a priest. He wanted to serve the Lord. We can only imagine the, the excitement, the, the anticipation. Hey, God, here I am. I see your glory. Oh my goodness, you're on the move. Here I am. Use me. Send me. Whatever you want me to do. Yes. Maybe you've had a, a personal experience with God before that was so profound for you. Maybe it was just you and God. Maybe it was you with some other Christians. But you you were so moved that you said something like this to God. God, just, just tell me what you want me to do and I'll do it. I, I, I just want to serve you. I, I, I love you so much. 
I, mean, I, 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 I have so many questions, but I, I love you. I want to serve you. Just tell me what you want to do, and I'll do it. My answer is yes. Now, that's very risky, okay? When you tell God, yes. Whatever you want me to do, yes. And, and maybe as you, like, think about it, you're like, whoa, why would you want to do that? But, but I'm talking about in the moment, you were so moved that, that maybe you expressed that. that okay, that's what's going on here with Ezekiel. And you know what God does? God says, okay. I've seen you fall face down. And so God speaks to Ezekiel. And he says, listen, I have a message that I want you to tell a group of people who have not been listening to me. And, 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 and it's not the Babylonians, but it's, it's, it's God's own people. And I want, I'm, I'm going to give you a new message. It's gonna, and by the way, as you read Ezekiel, this is a heavy message. Right? It's a heavy message. And the methods that God asked Ezekiel to do, which we'll look at a few of them, are, are edgy. It's sort of outlandish. It's eccentric. It's bizarre. But that leads us to the hard question. You know, we're going through this series, Stranger Things, the Bible, and we're asking some, some hard questions about God. And here's the, here's the hard question for today, which is, why would God uh, turn up the volume on his own people? What, what, is, what does that mean to turn up the volume? But why would God do that? I mean, uh, from an earthly standpoint, we might say, listen, God, take a hint. People are pushing you away. They're not interested in you. They just want to use you. They just want to, they just want to come and worship you on their own terms. They just want to come one day a week. Right? And, and, and God, just give them some space. All right? And if they, ever want to, if they ever want to come back to you, they will. I mean, I think since we get that, because we have, we have relationships, we have friendships with people, and maybe we see someone, and they're going down a wrong path, and so we have a conversation with them. Right? Listen, I, I'm concerned for you. I care for you. I just think if you keep going down that path, you're going to get into destruction. You're going you're to go through pain. I don't want you to see that. And, they, and you've, they've probably ignored you. They've dismissed you. They've downplayed your words. And so what we do, like, okay, listen, hey, um, when you're ready to talk, hey, we can, we can have a conversation. If you, if you ever want to come back, hey, my, my, my arms are wide open, okay? But, but, I'm, but if you want to keep going down that, if you want to ignore me, fine, I'll give you space. I think many of us, we can identify with that, but that's not who God is. See, so when we ask tough questions of God, it leads to a deeper and a greater revelation of who God is. And what do we see here? God's a pursuing God. God pursues us. Okay? God's going to pursue His own people by turning up the volume on His own people because He loves them. He knows that many of them will still not listen to Him. But for the sake of the few, He turns up the volume. He turns up the volume. Well, uh, let me give some specifics on, on some, of these, some of these methods that God asked Ezekiel to do. I'm going to share five with you. Uh, the first one, and these will be on the screen, the first one is this. Uh, God asked Ezekiel in chapter 3 to go into a, a uh, kind of a trance for a whole week to, to demonstrate the, how God was hurt how the anger of God because the people would not listen to him he just, so Ezekiel just shows up doesn't say anything he's like talk about awkward talk about eccentric for a week uh, the second one is Ezekiel becomes mute he can't speak for a certain time to symbolize God's people refusal to hear and respond to God's word. The third one is that Ezekiel 
is asked by God to lay on his left side for 390 days. And then after that's over, he has to do it for 40 more days on his right side to symbolize God's judgment on the northern and southern kingdoms of Israel. That corner leads to the question of what's Ezekiel going to eat, all right, for these for these uh, for these days? Well, that leads to the fourth sort of crazy and edgy uh, method, which is this: uh, God asked Ezekiel to uh, to bake some bread, okay, over cow dung, all right, to to, to symbolize. To symbolize that this food is defiled just like how they are. And, and, and Ezekiel had to, to, had to eat. Actually, if you read the story, it, initially God said um, human dung. You know, you know, but then Ezekiel says, I can't do that. And so, okay, the nude over cow to make the point. Like, they, they are defiled. Oh, by the way, uh, there's a U.S. food supplier that took... The recipe that's in verse 9 of chapter 4, and it's called Ezekiel bread. Maybe you've had it before. And uh, I, I, I'm pretty sure, okay, if you know anything different, let me know. But I'm pretty sure they bake it a little differently than uh, how Ezekiel did it. All right? I'm, I'm just saying, all right, if you know something different, let me, let me know. Okay? Uh, so that was number four. Uh, the last one, the fifth one, is, is this. Is that uh, Ezekiel had this you know, typical Jewish beard. And, and God says, I want you to take it off. Shave it off. And I want you to divide the trimmings up and to, uh, to, do, to do three different things. And this all symbolizes the coming judgment of God on his own people. There's more than that, the five. I just gave you five. But maybe you're beginning to see why uh, the Jewish leaders ask potential rabbis, please, please don't study Ezekiel. All right? Because you may just change your mind. <laughs> this is why uh, uh, most churches okay, avoid, uh, don't teach on the book of Ezekiel. Because it's so bizarre. And strange, crazy. But remember, hey, Ezekiel was one of the crazy ones. Why? Because he, because he, he thought that the one that could change the world was God. Remember, if, if you think that too, then you're you've joined the club with Ezekiel, and, and you're one of the crazy ones too. This T-shirt is for you as well. Well. Ezekiel keeps faithfully sharing these strange methods, okay? hoping for the people of God to, to listen and to respond. The volume is being turned up. God loves you more than you can imagine. God loves His people more than you can imagine. Despite the strangeness of these methods, I hope, I'm praying, I've been praying all week for you that you, you would see God's heart of love. His heart of love. Following Jesus today will uh, invite accusations, criticism, labels, even among Christians. Definitely the outside world. I'm going to give you just some, some examples of this. Uh, if you say, 
Jesus is the only way, the only truth, the only life. People would say, that is so unloving, that is so narrow-minded. Another example would be, as you look at all the social problems going on in the world, and if you say, listen, all social problems, the root of it is a spiritual problem. Right? Oh my goodness. Right? Get ready for criticism. And then if you went on and say, listen, uh, the, the solution... Because okay? all social problems have a, it's a spiritual problem, and the solution needs to begin spiritually, and that's Jesus. Okay? And all spiritual problems make itself visible in some way. You know, it could be individual, but it could be social. That's why to have an accurate theology of sin, sin is personal, but sin is social. And so all spiritual problems will make itself up individually and socially. That right there, even among some Christians, would say, ah, that's crazy. I don't, I don't know if I believe that. Or another example would be generosity. With your time and with your money. And, and, and you have some people outside the church and inside the church that say, listen, I don't think that's financially wise. That's actually foolish. Yeah, God says what? Give 10%? Okay, give 10%. Or give what you can. But then take the rest of the money and spend it on yourself. Enjoy life. And save. Okay? Save as much as you can. And give little. Yes. You know, when you give, it makes you feel better. And it, you know, it helps other people. So, so spend a lot on yourself. Save a lot. And you give little. But, but that, man, that's not a life of generosity. And so even saying that, people are going to criticize. What am I trying to say? Publicly following Jesus today will invite accusations of being weird, crazy, and strange, even among Christians. And yet here, here is where Ezekiel is so surprisingly relevant to us. Right? Because, and this is a rhetorical question, but do you feel at odds in your own culture with the values and the beliefs that you hold because they don't they don't share your beliefs and values and you're like ah. and it, 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 it even becomes more so every year well that was Ezekiel and we're not just talking about the, the culture out there we're talking about God's own people Ezekiel wanted to be faithful to God but he was actually a misfit for the people of God he, it's like he didn't fit in. He didn't belong, even among the people of God. In fact, as I, as I look at Ezekiel, I think maybe, uh, since it's so relevant, and I know that needs to be un unpacked because you, uh, you have all the, the strangeness and the bizarreness going on here, but it, it is very relevant to 2020. In fact, maybe next year we should spend the whole year going verse by verse through Ezekiel. That would be a, a good thing to do, but, uh, but actually next year, we're going to take the whole year and we're going to read straight through the Bible. As we celebrate 150 years of this church building, 150 for Jesus, and so uh, the message series for 2021 is going to be Jesus on every page, because Jesus is on every page. Every story Old Testament, New Testament, either shouts or whispers the name of Jesus. And you and I, we're going to see that. Old Testament, New Testament. We're either looking forward to Jesus or we're looking back. The name of Jesus is throughout. And so that's what we're doing. But Ezekiel... Surprising relevance. Because God wants not just to use Ezekiel to turn up the volume on the culture and on his own people. He wants to use you and me. I want to illustrate this by, by a, a graduation speech that Steve Jobs, right, one of the co-founders of Apple, the one that uh, narrated that commercial that we saw. He was giving a speech in 2005 to, in, 
to Stanford University graduating people. And what he said is still people think, oh, it's so inspiring, it's so, it's so remarkable. But this is what he said. He said, listen, your time is limited. Don't waste it by living someone's life. Don't be trapped by dogma, which is living with the results of other people's thinking. Don't let the noise of other, others' opinions drown out your inner voice. People are like, oh, I also love, you know, it's all life's about, you know, searching for your inner voice. Ezekiel words fell on deaf ears, but, but what Steve Jobs says and other people who say something similar to this, like people are like, oh, this is great, even among professing Christians. A few years ago, a, a study came out and it said the majority of Christians, when they're facing a difficult decision, when they're facing a, a crisis, look within themselves first. You know, trying to find that inner voice. But life's not about trying to find your inner voice. It's about trying to get your voice to tune to God's voice. That's where life begins. That's where freedom begins. This is actually what Jesus says. John chapter 8, verse 31 and 32 says this. He says, Jesus says, If you hold to my teaching, then you're really my disciples. And then... You'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. That'll be up on the screen, but that's what John 8, verse 31 and 32 says. Now that last phrase, is that all popular? Like, everyone uses it, every cause uses it, every politician uses it. Hey, hey, if the truth will set you free. But Jesus said it first, and he was very clear that says, you must hold to my teaching. Not someone else's teaching, not your own teaching, not, not a combination of whatever you want. No, my teaching, then, then you'll know the truth, which is who he is the truth. And then truth will set you free. To say that and get ready to be criticized, get ready to be unpopular. Here's something else that... Um, a lot of people think, including Christians. True happiness is found in, in, in finding who you are and then expressing it. I, I wonder how many people who profess to be Christians have given you some advice. You go to them and you're seeking counsel and you're seeking some advice and they say to you, listen, just follow your heart. Or whatever you do, if it makes you happy, then, then, then that's, that's what you need to do. Because God wants you to be happy. So you just, whatever makes you happy, you just do it. I mean, how many people believe that? A lot. How many Christians? Hey, well, God knows, but there is a lot of people that think that. Live for yourself. Be your own authority. But what does God's word say? Because, you know, remember, it's about tuning into God's voice. Well, here's what God says. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, all right? Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Uh, this, this is the Apostle Paul says, Listen, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. So, so life is not about living someone else's life. Life isn't about living the life you want, all right? Life's about allowing Jesus to live his life through you. And that's, you're going to get criticized if you, if you believe that, if you speak up for that. If you try to turn the volume up on the church and on people, say, listen, true freedom is found by surrendering your life to Jesus, by surrendering yourself to the Word. That's crazy. You can't change the world by that. Oh, but remember, the crazy ones are those that think they're crazy enough because God can change the world through you and me. Now, how does God do that? All right. How does God do that? Because there's many people in our culture Christians and not yet Christians 
who, who are confused, who are, who are empty. They, 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 they are not embracing true freedom, but they think they might. So what would God do? All right? And that leads us, that leads us to Ezekiel chapter 37. I told you Ezekiel is surprisingly relevant to what we're doing today in our nation. So from chapter 1, please turn, please turn to chapter 37. I'm going to read verse 1 through verse 14. All right, this is the word of the Lord. Ezekiel 37, verses 1 through 14 says this, The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them. And I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together bone to bone. I looked and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to it, This is what the sovereign Lord says, Come, breathe from the four winds and breath into these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. I came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say, our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says, my people, I'm going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people will know that I'm the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you and you will live. And I will settle you in your own land and you will know that I'm the Lord and I have spoken and I've done it, declares the Lord. What a scene. Ezekiel sees a spiritual wasteland. And we're not talking about the Babylonian culture, though that was certainly applied to them. But the spiritual wasteland is on the people of God. But that's not how the story ends. Actually, this vision is... is is incredible because it's a vision of hope and of life and of resurrection. And so how do these, these dead bones, these very dry bones, come back to life? Well, it's, it's, it happens in two stages, all right? And you and I need to know about this because as, as God turns up the volume on the culture, as God turns up the volume on His own people, He's going to do the same thing today as He did back then. What are these two stages? Well, the first stage is he tells Ezekiel, listen, proclaim, prophesy, preach my word to them. Which actually he has been doing, and they haven't really been listening. But he says, listen, keep, keep doing it. And the second stage we see is the Spirit of the living God, the Holy Spirit, come and moving, giving, breathing, life into them. And so we see the two things here. It's the proclamation of God's Word to the people and the power of God's Spirit moving in people. 
and resurrection, hope, life happens from all that. Why did, why did God want Ezekiel to, to know this? What? Certainly God wanted you and me to know about this strange and bizarre vision. Why? Well, God wanted Ezekiel. God wanted his people then and he wants his people now to see what's going on in the world with his eyes. And so let me ask you, as you look at what's going on in the world today, in the midst of a global pandemic, in the midst of a, of a growing, deep, divisive country, what do you see? With the eyes of God. And I would suggest to you that what you see with the eyes of God is very similar. Not, not exactly, but very similar to the vision here in Ezekiel 37. You, the eyes of the Lord, if you saw Him, you would see a wasteland. Right? You would see a spiritual wasteland. You would see a wasteland of pain. A, a, a wasteland of brokenness. A, a, a wasteland of people trying to to be their own authority. You would see a wasteland of shattered dreams. You would see a wasteland of people going through all these addictions, trying to fulfill them, because because what they think fulfills them isn't fulfilling them. You would see a wasteland. You would see emptiness. You would see deadness. You would see people exhausted, trying to live. Trying to perform by their own efforts. God says, Ezekiel, this, 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 this is, see. Now we might think, well, I'm no Ezekiel. I don't, even want to, I don't even want to be Ezekiel. But did you notice, as we read in Ezekiel 37, there was nothing about Ezekiel. Right? He was just a participant. It was all about the power of God's Word. Right? It was all about the power of the Spirit of God moving and breathing. Right? It wasn't about Ezekiel's personality. It wasn't about his delivery style. It was, it's all about God likewise. Because we think, God, I see the wasteland. I see the brokenness. God, what do you want me to do? Because some of us struggle. God, what's, my, what's, what's your role for me? Just, it's not complicated. It's just, listen, proclaim God's word. And allow the spirit to move in your life. So that when you proclaim his word, you do it in the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's what brings dry bones to life. That's what brings dead bones to life. Just proclaim God's word. Well, I don't have the I don't have the knowledge, I don't have the confidence. Just just proclaim God's word. Because it's not about you. And allow the Spirit to move in you. And this is, and this is such a vision of hope. I told you, I told you, that despite all the strangeness and the bizarreness going around in Ezekiel, man, it is surprisingly relevant to the calling of Christians today in 2020. So praise God, praise God, now we wrap this up. One of the major questions that the book of Ezekiel is asking you and me, it's not the only question, but it's a big question. And oftentimes people miss it, okay? Because of the strangeness of the book and the edginess of Ezekiel's methods. Simply, are you hearing the voice of God so that you can stand up and speak up for Jesus? 
Remember, it's not about you. The power is not in you. It's not in your personality. It's not in your knowledge. It's, it's not in your confidence level. Okay? It's not in your favorite person that you listen to. It's not in your favorite author. It's not in a politician. It's not in a government program. It's not in a political party. No, that's not where the power lies. The power lies in the Word of God, proclaiming it through the power of the Holy Spirit. That what brings life. And, and, and who knows, who knows how many of us listening to this message as we're dealing with a strange story, a strange character in Ezekiel, and you are like, God, here I am. Set, use me, send me. Yes, Lord. Even if the message is a little crazy, Send me, use me, because God has given you eyes to see the wasteland of the culture, the brokenness of his church. And you're like, listen, I really, like, as you think about it, like, I don't know if I want the message. I don't know if I want to say yes, but you see, you know, because of Ezekiel 37. Okay? You, you see this, you know this, that if there's any hope for an awakening in the culture, if there's any hope, for a revival in the church, if there's any hope for a, uh, for a renewal in individual people, it, it can only happen through the proclaiming of His Word, through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so you're saying, yes. Lord, I, I know I'm going to get labeled. I know people are going to criticize me. I know it's going to be unpopular. I know people say, you're crazy. You're crazy. If you think that. Oh, but remember Ezekiel, all right? Here's to the crazy ones. Here's to the people who don't fit in because they, because they think that God can change the world. And that He invites you to do the same thing. So some of us here... When I ask the question, have you heard God's voice? You're like, I don't know. It's been a long time. Maybe you've never heard the voice of the Lord before. And if that's you, just, just allow the Spirit of God to breathe on you. <sighs> Some of you here, you, you're Christians. You said yes to Jesus, but you're dry. You're exhausted. You're tired. That's, that's many Christians going through whatever what, what we're all going through. So what, what, what do you do? Well, you just, you, just, you just allow the Word of God to the power of the Holy Spirit to breathe on you. Whew. Some of us here, we're, we're like, yeah, I follow Jesus, but there's certain elements of my life that I don't want God to touch. Like, God, don't tell me, okay, don't tell me my political views, right? God, don't, don't tell me that I need to sort of get rid of some friends and make some new friends. Don't, don't, don't go there. Don't tell me to give up that habit. You know I need that habit. God, that person's annoying. That person's demanding. Don't tell me to keep loving on them. I don't want to hear it. If that's you, just to allow God to breathe His truth, His hope, His love on you. <sighs> Those of us who, who struggle how, to see God's goodness in the midst of chaos and confusion and of brokenness and of pain, what do we do? Well, just, why don't you just read Ezekiel 37 again? And again, and again, and as long as it takes to see right? the power is in the Word, the power is in the Spirit. And, and that's what God's asking me to do. Just, just proclaim the truth that I know and allow the Spirit to move in my life so that, so that, when, I, that when I breathe out Renewal. It will. It will. It will. It will spread to other people. 
And then the church, there'll be revival and there's, there'll be an awakening in the culture. Oh, Lord, let us start with me. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you do show up in our lives to turn the volume up. And I thank you that you invite us. Lord, I pray that for everyone listening to this message right now and in the future, that they would know, like, listen, you, you just didn't call Ezekiel to this. Every follower you call to proclaim your word through the power of the Spirit. And so, Spirit of the living God, work afresh in us. So that, 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 that the change that we experience can be spread to individuals and there can be renewal and that, that it would then grow within the church to be revival and then it would grow to a spiritual awakening to the culture. Lord, help us to see what you see as you look out at the church. Help us to see what you see when we look at the culture. Lord, let us not be overwhelmed because we know the power is not in us. It's not in our knowledge. It's not in our confidence. It's not in our personality. It's not in our delivery style. It's the power is in your word. Praise God for that. Your power is in the spirit. Praise God for that. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Oh, I wanted to just bless you with that. Well, at this time, the, the service ends. And so God bless you. God bless you. Uh, remain seated as, as the ushers come forward to, to miss you. See you next week.